Hello, everyone. Carmen Johnson here with the Healthy Kids Revolution. We are just waiting momentarily to get started. And if you'll just, just, I don't think there's any music playing, but just wanted to let you all know that Pam Colleen's presentation will start here in just a minute. So thanks for hanging on and look for the slides. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healthy Kids Revolution Summit. We are in our next day of expert advice coming in from Pam Colleen. I would love to welcome Pam. Pam, welcome so much to our summit. Are Thank you, you on the great line? to be here, Carmen. Thank you for inviting yes. me. Oh, you're so welcome. And, you know, I'm so excited to share why Pam is here. She is going to give us something that I think all you moms and dads on the line are going to love, and it is that she's going to talk about brain-boosting foods for our kids. Obviously, the goal of our whole summit is to give you parents some very simple tools and strategies to use and to uncomplicate the mess that we have as far as the diets and guidelines that we have in our world as far as getting our kids healthy. And Pam's got some great information. So just to, so you'll know who Pam is, she is the author of Addiction, the Hidden Epidemic. And just because it says addiction, do not be confused to think that this is just about alcohol and drugs. She talks in her book about sugar being an addiction food being an addiction, and her reviews on that book are tremendous. She also co-authored the New York Times best-selling book, The Great Bird Flu Hoax. Um, she's been independently studying nutrition and natural health for over 20 years, but she does not look old enough. I know her photo looks like she's 16, and I know we all hate her when she looks so beautiful, but she's been studying this stuff for 20 years from her own problems, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical insensitivities, and not insensitivities, multiple chemical sensitivities, that's a mouthful, um, and then ADD. So she is clearly experienced from a very personal perspective of how our bodies react when we treat, when we feed our bodies nutritionally. So um, she is has spent now these years being a nutritional consultant. She offers clients a very comprehensive program about balancing out your biochemistry and Wonderful talk radio host. So we are so excited to have her here. And Pam, I know you've got a slideshow for us. I hope everybody has clicked over on the left on your screen where it says view the slides. And without further ado, Pam is going to share some super information for us on how to brain boost um, our kids with some certain foods. So Pam, you are welcome to take it away. Thank you, Carmen. It's, it's great to be here, and uh, today I'm talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is, of course, nutrition and how food affects our mood. Uh, this is the reason why I wrote my last book, Addiction, The Hidden Epidemic, and uh, one of the reasons why I wrote that book is because I'm so concerned about our children today, and uh, so I want to start off with the first slide here, uh, showing why I am so terribly concerned about our children and why my book is a call to action in order to help uh, prevent, hopefully, I want to talk about this from a prevention standpoint. Uh, the, I want to be able to help people prevent this uh, catastrophe that is going on right now with regards to the mental instability we're seeing among our youth. And uh, I just want to show a few references here on this first slide uh, where um, right now it's saying that depression is the fourth leading cause of disability worldwide and by 2020 the World Health Organization is saying that uh, depression is going to be the second leading cause of disability worldwide. Currently in North America, depression is the leading cause of disability already. So it's, it's causing, it's costing society, you know, billions of dollars every single year. Uh, but because uh, mood disorders and uh, the associated uh, d addictions are the elephant in the room, Carmen, um, you know, unfortunately people tend to turn a blind eye to this uh, subject matter. When, when I look at these conditions, I see the physical uh, contributions that create this mental instability among society today. So I'm going to be talking about that in this presentation. Uh, next, of course, uh, we see where I live here in London, Ontario, uh, a school board actually did a survey among the teachers, and the teachers said that over 25% of children have some sort of mental health problem. This was not the case when I was uh, in my teens or younger. I noticed that, of course, we always had eccentric or quirky kids in the classroom, but I certainly didn't see this mental instability among my peers when I was uh, very young. And then, of course, here in Canada, front cover of uh, McLean's magazine 
saying that uh, this generation of kids on campus in colleges and universities uh, are called the broken generation, and the subtitle is why so many of our best and brightest students report feelings of hopeless, depressed, uh, re report feelings of hopelessness, uh, depression, or even suicide. So this is um, an epidemic that we have on our hands. It is unprecedented. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to start looking at the physical and nutritional reasons behind these issues. These are not conditions that are uh, due to Ritalin deficiencies or Prozac deficiencies, okay? Uh, there are some real physical uh, reasons for it. And uh, the next slide, I'm showing just a cartoon of uh, somebody who's, who's drawn this where uh, what I try to do is summarize this phenomenon by asking people to avoid the middle aisles in a grocery store. That indeed, since uh, the uh, technologies have been developed to give uh, food shelf life, it's the thousands and thousands of foods that line the middle aisles of a grocery store that essentially have contributed to not just this physical health crisis that we're seeing, but this mental health crisis that we're seeing. And I always say, uh, to my students that, you know, these middle aisles of a grocery store are actually blocking our view from uh, seeing the real food that is in the outer periphery of the grocery store. So these middle aisles are gro blocking our view from seeing the chicken and the meat and the eggs and so on. Uh, awesome. If you visualize, yeah, if you visualize um, Little yeah. House on the Prairie, Carmen, and you uh, see the general store in that series, and you walk in the general store, there's no, hardly any food in that general store, right? It, that you go to the general store to get maybe some sugar, some flour. You go there to get your clothes, uh, whatever, uh, you know, you may need in, in your household. But back in the 1800s, for example, uh, we would have, most of us had a small family farm. We would have produced our right. food on our own. And the cows would have been outside, the pigs would have been outside, the chickens would have been outside. We had a very sustainable model of food. And in so doing, of course, we had much greater health in terms of our overall mental health and physical health than we do today. So we see this degeneration, this deterioration in quality of our food over the last hundred or so years uh, since we've developed the technologies uh, that allow for shelf stability. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I ask people just to uh, avoid those middle aisles in a grocery store because these foods that are sitting in the middle aisles are experimental foods and we're the guinea pigs. And since this experiment has uh, been snowballing over the last 100 years, of course, uh, we're no better off for it. So the next slide I want to point out, uh, just some uh, graphics, uh, some uh, examples of how we, got, uh, how we got roped into buying these newfangled foods. And uh, post-World War II, what happened was is these newfangled foods uh, really uh, took, you know, took off in the 1950s. And uh, at first, and I don't want to sound chauvinistic here, but the women back then, of course, mm -hmm. did most of the shopping. And uh, so the women were looking at these uh, foods with a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, suspicion that they really did not take to these foods at first. And so when surveys were done in the 1950s asking women about these foods, if women had purchased these foods, they admitted that they felt shame and they felt guilt for buying mm -hmm. these foods. And so the food industry had a conundrum and said, oh, boy, how do we please our shareholders because we've got shareholders uh, vested in this. We have to make sure that consumers buy these products. So what the food industry did was they actually financially influenced the ladies' magazines at the time and the food writers to slant uh, articles and to slant ads to tell women that uh, making food from scratch was an inferior task that buying these newfangled foods would make them more progressive as women, more modern. And so, and, and then really, Carmen, this is still a very pervasive message wow. that's among us today. And so uh, people, yeah, people view cooking food from scratch as a menial task uh, even today. And, and when you look at the television uh, and you look at the Food Network, for example, and all of the cooking demonstrations that we see on television, I have to ask myself some days, are people just living vicariously through these uh, food shows where we are being shown how to cook food from scratch? So are we actually watching these shows just for entertainment, or are we actually learning uh, from these shows so that we can go into the kitchen and make food from scratch, which is really the healthiest way to cook? Uh, and, and, so, and I don't see it happening, quite honestly. Uh, people are, are living in this fast new world, and we're really not honoring this uh, this really age-old type of tradition where we knew that uh, homemade meals were much, much healthier than these uh, newfangled foods and fast foods that uh, really are just so pervasive today. Mm -hmm. 
So the next slide, I, I want to point out that one of the greatest changes in our food supply over the last 100 years has been the introduction of plant-based uh, oils like soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, cottonseed oil, and how these oils uh, and the um, associated spreads or margarines have displaced more nutrient-dense foods like butter, lard, and tallow. Uh, I want to point out that uh, you know, these are newfangled foods that our bodies are just not adjusting well to these oils, uh, that we're really not designed for these types of fats, that really as we evolved as a species, of course, in order for our brains to have developed, uh, that we would have depended upon the fats that come from animal foods. Uh, historically, of course, uh, we knew that these animal fats were considered in many cultures all around the world uh, as being sacred foods. And so as we have uh, gradually introduced these newfangled oils and spreads and margarines in our diet, uh, and we see this uh, graph here showing how much they have invaded our food supply over the last 100 years, that certainly as we've in introduced these foods, we've seen a degradation in our overall physical health, but not just that, mm -hmm. also our mental health as well. So it's the displacement of these newfangled foods in our diet uh, that has caused a lot of the health problems that we're seeing today. So we need to go back to the way we used to eat before we started suffering with what I call fat phobia, cholesterol phobia. Before mm -hmm. we had these phobias, these food phobias, we were much healthier than, than we are now. And this, you know, really started transpiring uh, after we invented hydrogenation in 1909, but really catapulted post uh, World War II. And so in, in that era, bef between 1909 and, and the post-World War II era, we really had a chance still to be healthy because still many of us were eating, uh, happily eating things like butter and lard and tallow. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we were slowly reducing our consumption of these foods, but still we had a chance to be healthy before World War II because we didn't suffer from fat phobia, cholesterol phobia, bacon phobia, liver phobia, red meat phobia, dairy phobia, uh, chicken skin phobia, gravy phobia. We didn't have these food phobias before World War II, and we were much, much healthier both physically and mentally in that era than we are today now that we unfortunately suffer with these food phobias. So let's go to the next slide here, and I'll just show you another graphic showing how they're even predicting uh, potentially more sales of these and these newfangled oils and fats in our society, and that's going to lead to even more uh, health problems, both mental and physical, okay. as we uh, progress. And then the next slide, I just want to show you some study, uh, uh, some research that has been published in psychosomatic medicine, basically saying that the imbalance of fatty acids in the typical first world diet is likely associated with the sharp increase in depression and inflammatory diseases seen over the past century. So this essentially encapsulates this shift that we've seen in our fats, in our con the consumption of our fats in our diet uh, over the last 100 years, and in particular, even more so the last 50 years or so in our diet. Uh, that even the scientific literature is actually showing that we should not have displaced the animal fats and we shouldn't have, uh, you know, really bombarded our uh, dinner plates with uh, these um, uh, plant-based oils and fats as much as we have. Mm -hmm. So the next slide, uh, number eight, uh, I'm going to show here a, a slide that is showing that indeed we have dramatically reduced our consumption of foods like butter. Uh, that line, that red line that's going across the page could easily be eggs, meat, tallow, lard. I mean, we have seen a, a sharp reduction in a lot of these types of traditional foods in our diet over the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, and as we have been reducing these foods, of course, uh, we see an increase in food, in chronic diseases, uh, like heart disease and cancer, but we also see more mental instability as well. And we can see by looking at this graph that by reducing, uh, animal fats in our diet, and in this case I'm looking at butter, uh, there's no correlation whatsoever between eating, uh, things like butter and, uh, heart disease or cancer, but yet the media and even the commercials we see on television today still tell us that these uh, saturated fats will cause things like heart disease. And, and nothing could be further from the truth, of course, because when we were eating uh, most of our diet, and keep in mind before World War II, uh, when we were much healthier, we would have gotten about 70% of our calories from animal fat. Uh, wow. And uh, so after World War II, that's when we start to reduce our consumption of these traditional foods, and that's when we start to see the rise of illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, and even more mental disorders in society. And uh, the next uh, page is just a, a, chart, a chart showing 
uh, our increase in consumption of sugar. Uh, and so back in the 1700s, of course, we would have only eaten about four pounds of sugar per person per year. And uh, dramatically, we've seen increases in this uh, in our sugar consumption. And what happened uh, post-World War II, of course, is that uh, we start to see a rise of heart disease as uh, the displacement of traditional foods had already been taking place somewhat in society. And so heart disease started to increase uh, circa around 1920. And so around 1950 or so, heart disease uh, was getting a lot of media attention. And even the president at the time, at around that time, had heart disease. So the scientific community was scrambling around trying to find uh, reasons why we were seeing so much heart disease. And unfortunately, we took our eye off the target uh, hmm. Professor John Yudkin, who is out of the UK, he was saying it was our, con- our increase in consumption of sugar that was causing the inflammation that was leading to heart disease. But he was very quiet and very shy man. And on this side of the pond in the United States, mm-hmm. Dr. Ansel Keys, he was saying it was the animal fat and cholesterol that was causing the rise in heart disease. But Ansel Keys was very charismatic, very gregarious. The media really liked him. And unfortunately... Ah. Uh, the story rolled from Dr. Ansel Keys, and that's when we start to see that rather than blaming our increase in consumption of sugar on this rise in inflammation that was going on in society, we started blaming animal fat. So the the wrong, um, you know, um, huh. per, the wrong um, uh, food was being blamed on on disease. We should have really been blaming sugar this entire time, or our increase in consumption of sugar, I should say. So on the next slide, I just want to point out that even the British Medical Journal uh, is uh, blaming sugar for a lot of the disease that we see today. He's, mm-hmm. The sh- British Medical Journal here is saying, uh, this dates back to 2005, I think it is, sugar is as dangerous as tobacco and in terms of world health, far more important. Sugar is an enormous burden throughout life. It destroys sh- children's teeth, it leads to obesity, and it exacerbates diabetes, a disease that eventually destroys every organ. Sugar should be classified as a hard drug, for it is addictive and harmful. And then finally, uh, the British Medi- Medical Journal is saying, there will be a considerable cost attached to the cessation of sugar consumption, but this will be negligible in comparison with the cost of the disease burden attributable to sugar. Uh, so not only will we be healthier, we will save a lot of cost. And, uh, of course, here we see in, in the entire continent in North America, both in Canada where I live and in the United States, of course, that our health care crisis is indeed bankrupting both of our countries, and we need to come up with some very tangible solutions for this problem. Now, the next slide on uh, slide 11, of course, when I'm talking about sugar, I'm not just talking about refined sugars. I'm also mm. talking about okay. sugar that is naturally occurring in fruits and vegetables and even grains. I'm not against the consumption of fruits and vegetables. I am against the overconsumption of fruits and vegetables. I'm a recovering raw food vegan, and I took it too literally, unfortunately. I ate way too many fruits and vegetables, and unfortunately, it really starved my brain uh, and damaged my metabolism dramatically. So I want to warn people not to overconsume these fruits and vegetables. Uh, We have indeed been listening to uh, the USDA's food, uh, food guide in Canada. We have our own food guide. It's very similar. Uh, so we have, unfortunately, been listening to their advice where they say eat 5 to 10 servings uh, of fruits and vegetables on top of eating 6 to 11 servings of grains. What this means, wow. Carmen, is that That's you're awful. eating yeah, sugar <laughs> on top of sugar. That's what yeah, that means. That's terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in my mind, you know, carbohydrates are fruits, wow. vegetables, grains, and also, you know, refined um Sugars and even juices, mm-hmm. of course, which are, mm-hmm. you know, drinking juice is like, you know, loaded. eating a Snickers bar. Yeah, it's just loaded <laughs> with sugar. So, um, yes, fruits and vegetables have their place. Of course, the antioxidants in these foods are great for preserving the animal fats that you're eating. Uh, but uh, don't try not to overdo it because keep in mind that eating too many fruits and vegetables in one setting is, could potentially throw off your blood sugar. Uh, and uh, so just, and keep in mind as well that, you know, the last ice age ended 12,500 years ago, and we invented agriculture 10,000 years ago. So I constantly remind people that during the last ice age, 12,500 years ago, we did not have uh, greenhouses back then. So we're really not designed to eat a lot of carbohydrates in our diet. 
And that indeed has led to our demise by, by listening to this kind of advice where uh, we're, to, we're being told to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And let me switch to the next slide here where I show that indeed uh, we are indeed e eating more grain in our diet. You know, that mantra that we hear so often in the media, uh, Carmen, where they say, eat your whole grains, right? Absolutely. Well, uh, it, you know, like I always say, sugar is sugar is sugar, and a grain is a grain is a grain. I mean, it's still a source of sugar, whether it's a whole uh, grain or whether it's refined. It's still a source of sugar, and we need to be cautious about over-consuming grains. And I don't have time to get into this today, but of course if people are eating grain, uh, grain should be pre-digested. So our ancestors mm -hmm. knew that uh, if we are going to eat grain, that it needs some preparation time. And that's why we see in so many cultures around the world that uh, they have their own versions of sourdough bread in their diets is because they knew that grain needed some TLC before, consum before consumption, uh, that it needed uh, to be fermented in order to, or soaked in order to break down what are known as anti-nutrients. So uh, not only do I uh, caution my, my clients not to over-consume grain, I am telling them if they do eat grain that it should be properly prepared in advance. Mm -hmm. So the next slide I just want to show, again, some uh, government numbers showing that indeed in recent history we have unfortunately been listening to uh, government guidelines uh, telling us to increase our consumption of carbohydrates or what I also call plant-based foods. So here we see in this um, chart that we are indeed eating more carbohydrates, which uh, means that we have displaced the animal fats and protein. So uh, we have moved uh, down in our consumption of fat, which is unfortunate. And we have also decreased our consumption of protein. And in this uh, particular chart, uh, this government chart, they're showing that this has an association with obesity. And keep in mind that with obesity, there are over 40 health-related problems associated with obesity. But I've added a, a sidebar here as well showing that uh, this change in our, this dramatic change in our diet has also led to a host of other health problems as well, not just uh, physical health problems, but mental health problems as, as mm -hmm. well. <clears throat> so if we go to the slide 14, um, what I'm yep. saying here is, is that over-consuming carbohydrates, whether it's sugar, whether it's juice, whether it's too many fruits and vegetables or too much grain in the diet, uh, puts us on a roller coaster ride in terms of our blood sugar control. And in shell that it is synonymous with saying hypoglycemia. And so uh, we end up spiking our insulin, uh, throwing ourselves on this blood sugar roller coaster ride, and this is essentially making us extremely vulnerable to mood issues. And I think a lot of your listeners mm -hmm. will realize that, you know, just before a meal, if you've waited, waited too long before a meal, uh, a lot of people will report that they're grouchy and irritable. So we know that uh, when blood sugar drops, it does have an influence on mood. So we, uh, by, by straying from traditional eating habits, of course, we have set, us up, set ourselves up for hypoglycemia or what this slide is showing as the hypoglycemic syndrome, which can lead to things like depression, moodiness, tiredness, memory impairment, poor concentration, and even addiction issues. So let me elaborate a little bit more uh, with regards to our children. So the next slide showing carbohydrate addiction in children. And I'm just going to, uh, this is, I think, something I have I pulled out of my book, Addiction, the Hidden Epidemic. Okay. Our, addic our children are drowning in a flood of carbo-rich foods that are making them overweight, unfocused, under-motivated, hyperactive, and overly mood-responsive. Carbohydrate addiction has been classified as a true addiction and that victims get caught in a vicious carbo-cycle. Excessive amounts of carbohydrates lead to abnormally high insulin levels, which lead to more intense carbohydrate cravings. Carbohydrate-addicted kids have a propensity for problems that include a range of behavior, mood, and learning disabilities. And some children, of course, have been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. On the next slide, uh, this is some information that I pulled from uh, Carbohydrate-Addicted Kids, written by two doctors, Heller and Heller. Uh, the signs and symptoms of carbohydrate addiction, and many of your listeners probably can identify with this, is a focus on starchy foods, junk foods, snack foods, or sweets, often to the exclusion of other foods, a desire to snack rather than eat whole, uh, balanced meals. Uh, you can see swings of, yeah. in energy levels, moods, ability to concentrate or motivation, unexplained outbursts of anger or periods of withdrawal, heightened emotionality, including sensitivity, crying, insecurity, or clinging, and weight problems or incidents of uncontrollable eating. 
Okay. And, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, covering the full gamut. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, a lot of people are very, um, they don't connect, uh, you know, what the solution to this problem is. I see a lot of people running around trying to take supplements to fix this problem when really one of the main things people can do to be healthy today is to return to the way we used to eat before World War II when we were much more uh, when, when we were healthier, both mentally and physically. So we knew back in you know 1940s to sit down and eat a, a bacon and egg style breakfast and a meat and potato mm. style lunch and dinner. We didn't have any food phobias around those items back then, and and mm-hmm. we were much more stable. So uh, slide 17 uh, is just some um, research that, that was done back in the 1920s of autopsies of dead people. Uh, the, the people were dead from hypoglycemia, and these autopsies revealed widespread degeneration and necrosis of nerve, nerve cells, particularly in the cerebral cortex, the brain region responsible for higher intellectual function. So essentially uh, what these researchers noted was that hypoglycemia led to brain damage. And slide 18, uh, just some more research uh, here showing hyperinsulinemia, a common cause of persistent hypoglycemia in infants and children, can result in permanent uh, damage to the central nervous system. And, of course, alcoholism, eating disorders, and many drug addictions are associated with ab- abnormal glucose metabolism. And this is something that I highlight uh, quite regularly throughout my book, Addiction, the Hidden Epidemic. Okay. Okay, so let's go to slide 19 uh, about ADD and ADHD and hypoglycemia. And uh, historically, of course, I've also been diagnosed with ADD myself. Uh, Mm -hmm. Many physicians and researchers believe that the symptoms of ADD and ADHD may be caused or exacerbated by food allergies or metabolic disorders such as hypoglycemia. There's that word again. Mm -hmm. Hypoglycemia is, of course, low blood sugar or this roller coaster ride that we put ourselves on uh, because we're not eating enough animal fat in our diet regularly throughout the day. Hypoglycemia can be directly affected, uh, can directly affect the cerebral cortex of the brain so that perceptions can become distorted, learning becomes faulty, concentration drops off, rage can develop, and criminal behavior can occur. occur. Other problems resulting from hypoglycemia can include depression, memory loss, psychosis, violence, insomnia, and so on. So uh, there's, there is, you know, growing research here showing that, um, you know, that eating too many carbohydrates is uh, deleterious to our health. The next slide, slide 20, I'm showing some research that was done back in 1976 where for five weeks students were allowed to eat what they wanted from meat, fruit, and vegetables with a carbohydrate intake uh, between 60 and 120 grams. After that, objective tests were administered. IQ scores had, uh, scores had increased in some children, but it was not clear if this was a result of diet or instruction. After all the tests were administered, the children were allowed to eat high carbohydrate, a high carbohydrate breakfast. Within a half an hour of breakfast, students' behavior, student behavior began to disintegrate. There were fights, crying, giggly, talkativeness, and falling up the stairs like a bunch of drunks. The older students who had previously displayed self-control began smart-mouthing their friends and instructors. And by 10.30 in the morning, there had been numerous reports of stomach aches and vomiting. And uh, further to this study, slide 21, uh, when uh, the IQ tests were done, uh, it said here, instead of scores rising, uh, the IQs of at least nine children had dropped below 75, which would merit a diagnosis of mental retardation. So here they're even saying that our intelligence, uh, of course, is potentially adversely affected by eating too many carbohydrates. So the next slide, slide 22, I want to show you a visual of what this means in terms of this roller coaster ride that we're putting ourselves on simply because we're dysregulating our blood sugar by eating all of these wonderful healthy fruits and vegetables and grains that our government is telling us to eat. And here we see a huge contradiction in a medical text that I actually own, and it's dated from 1944. And uh, this is just uh, something I've scanned, so the quality of this slide isn't mm-hmm. the greatest, but I think you can see the outline of the uh, graph where you see the rise in blood sugar uh, after eating uh, a high-carbohydrate meal versus what you actually want, which is the dotted line at the, underneath it. You want, you want your mm-hmm. blood sugar to be relatively level after a meal. You don't want it to spike very, very high. You want it to be level. And here... The doctors make this astounding recommendation, which was very common back then, to eat lots of animal fat in the diet. In fact, here, uh, underlined in red, it says eat between 65 and 75 percent fat in the diet. And, of course, back then that would have meant animal fat because we didn't have uh, animal fat or cholesterol phobia back then. 
so here you see the doctors from a medical school saying that to regulate your blood sugar, which means regulating your mood, which means feeding your brain, that you need to get adequate amounts of animal fat in the diet. And uh, so it's unfortunate that now we see the uh, opposite today coming from our medical schools and our governments and even the media that uh, unfortunately the advice they're giving us today is the absolute opposite. Uh, we don't have any historic reference to eating a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Historically, man has always eaten a very high fat diet. And uh, if we hadn't, of course, our brains wouldn't have evolved as much as they have today. In fact, the research is showing that as we have been displacing animal foods and replacing them with more plant-based foods, that indeed our brains are actually shrinking. Wow. So let's go to what this means in terms of our nervous system, essentially, our neuroendocrine system, if you will. A lot of what I do centers around regulating people's blood sugar. That's very, very important. But one of the reasons why it's important to regulate your blood sugar is because it takes a lot of the stress or the burden off of your body's batteries or what are called the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are what I call the body's batteries. And the adrenal glands carry many, many roles. They're not only responsible for producing things like sex hormones, uh, they're also responsible for controlling the balance of minerals in our body. Uh, and under that umbrella, that also means that the adrenal glands play a very crucial role in terms of their ability to kick out unwanted or excess metals. So when metals start to overaccumulate in the body, now these can be uh, toxic metals like mercury, lead, etc., but they can also be healthy minerals like copper, uh, which we are unfortunately overexposed to today for many, many reasons that I don't have time to get into right now. Mm-hmm. But we we don't want to over-accumulate uh, metals in our body. We want them to be balanced, right. and the adrenal glands play a very, very crucial role in terms of balancing minerals. Now, when what I say here is this, I want to basically – uh, talk about why we're seeing so much illness today, and I want people to connect the dots because if people don't understand these fundamental principles, they could scramble around for 10, 20, 30, 40 years looking for answers to their health problems, but without understanding the root cause of their health problems. I mean, that's the average client that I see is that they've been scrambling around for 10, 20, 30, 40 years looking for answers, but not understanding these these fundamental principles. Mm-hmm. So, number one, we need to regulate our blood sugar. One of the reasons why we need to regulate our blood sugar is so that we relax. We keep the adrenal glands in a state of relaxation. They are a backup system to controlling our blood sugar as well. But we don't want to turn to the adrenal glands to control our blood sugar. We want to keep those adrenal glands in a nice, relaxed mode. So if we're skipping meals, if we're waiting too long in between meals, or if we're not eating enough animal fat, in, a, in our diet, then we are going to destabilize our blood sugar, and then the adrenal glands are going to be in an alarm state. They are going to be turned on when really they're not designed to be turned on that often, okay? And so over time, because we are using this backup system from the adrenal glands, then they will get weak, okay? Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why you don't want the adrenal glands to get weak is because like I said, that they are also balancing minerals in the body and they are also responsible for sending out messages in the body to grab at excess or unwanted metals, whether it's mercury, lead, or excessive copper in the body. And they're supposed to, and these proteins are supposed to grab at these unwanted metals and take them to your bile and then exit. And the bile is supposed to take these metals out into the toilet where they belong. And unfortunately, because we have reduced our consumption of animal fat in the diet, which by default means we have also reduced our consumption of dietary cholesterol, uh, now we run into lots of problems. So let me show you what that means for the next slide here, Carmen. Uh, actually, let me skip the slide on the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, if people just take a quick look here, show that they are responsible for producing the adrenaline or the fight or flight hormones, but also they're responsible for producing, uh, our sex hormones or our chill out, relaxing hormones, and we, we need to make sure that the adrenal glands are, uh, not too stressed, 
uh, too often in the course of the day so that we can produce things like progesterone, estrogen, DHE, pregnenolone, and so on. Unfortunately, our, our adrenal glands are so busy in this fight-or-flight mode that uh, the other important uh, jobs like putting, pushing out estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, all these hormones become compromised because the adrenal glands are busy doing other things. Uh, but let me show you the next slide where I talk about on slide 25 the gallbladder and bile production. So without enough animal fat in the diet, without enough dietary cholesterol in the diet, then what happens, uh, Carmen, is bile production becomes compromised. And as I mentioned, that for the body to regulate uh, and get rid of unwanted metals, bile needs to be very thin. It needs to, we need to be producing probably up to a, a liter a vial a day, but as uh, we have reduced our consumption of uh, animal fat and cholesterol in our diet, vial production has gotten sluggish, if you will, and so it gets backed up, and so our ability to kick out metals is compromised, and so this is so core to the work that I do, jump-starting vial production in the body. This is not easy to do, Carmen. Mm. If we had never turned to a low-fat diet, uh, if we had never become uh, animal fat or cholesterol phobic, this mm-hmm. impairment it wouldn't be an issue today because the key thing is is that since the dawn of civilization, we have confronted things like heavy metals in society today. Uh, our bodies actually should have the wherewithal to know what to do with these metals and to kick them out appropriately. But because our adrenal glands have gotten so weak and because bile production has become so impaired, we have lost the ability to uh, kick out unwanted metals. And keep in mind that when metals get backed up in the body, uh, this will impair mood. This will throw off neurotransmitters. This will impair thyroid function. This will impair hormones, essentially. Mm-hmm. So I see a lot of people running around trying to take supplements or drugs to help fix a lot of these problems. But until we actually turn the adrenals back on appropriately, until we balance the minerals, until we boost bile production so that the metals take their exit like they should have been all along, it's very hard to get people back running on all eight cylinders. So I tell people this from a prevention standpoint because fixing uh, these problems after they have become an issue is very difficult to do. That's what I do with my clients. It takes really an average of two years to undo the damage done by this um, impairment. So let's talk about this from an, uh, a, a preventative standpoint. Uh, okay. That really, if people can understand the last few slides mm. and eat the way our ancestors ate when we were pretty healthy, then these mm-hmm. systems should be clicking along quite nicely, and I wouldn't be as busy as I am today. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Anyway, there's, there's lots more I can say about this slide on the gallbladder and bile. If, uh, if we're producing enough bile, of course, uh, we need that bile uh, to be produced uh, appropriately so that we can absorb things like uh, minerals, uh, calcium, iron, zinc, magnesium, and these wonderful long-chain fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins that uh, occur in uh, these animal fats that our ancestors, of course, thrived and survived on quite nicely. So the next slide, slide 26, is showing that the government is contradicting itself here because the government is telling us uh, to eat a low-fat diet, which historically, of course, we know the meaning of low-fat is a diet low in animal fat. And here the government is saying that, uh, you know, there's a warning here about low-fat diets, saying that they're associated with lower levels of calcium, zinc, magnesium, iron, phosphorus, vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, folic acid, and niacin. And these... Nutrients are crucial for, for brain function, for, um, you know, for your overall metabolism. I mean, th- these are very, very important nutrients, and yet the government is saying that their own advice essentially is leading to malnutrition. I mean, this is just criminal, quite honestly. So here we see uh, t- uh, slide 27, a cartoon. I feature this cartoon in my book, actually, where two students are talking to each other, and one is saying, trade you some Cheetos and a Ritalin for your cupcake and a Zoloft. Uh, And, of course, then I cite, it takes an extraordinary intelligence to contemplate the obvious. I mean, these foods are not sustaining our health, both Mm -hmm. physically and mentally. And it's no wonder our teachers here, where I live in London, Ontario, are saying that over 25% of our students have some sort of mental disorder. Uh, Yet I don't see the school systems 
taking the appropriate action. In fact, I write about this in my book because, uh, yes, there's a lot of healthy school initiatives out there, but unfortunately what they deem to be healthy is still not healthy enough for our precious children. Uh, right. A lot of these healthy school initiatives are actually promoting a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet which is unacceptable for our children. I see some of these healthy school initiatives are serving things like juice instead of whole milk. Uh, I see some of these uh, healthy school initiatives are promoting lots and lots of fruits and vegetables and even grain in the diet, uh, which is still unacceptable. These healthy school initiatives should be more focused on making sure that the children are getting enough animal fat in the diet. And, in fact, I have a book it's 100 years old, Carmen, and it's written by, what at the time, a woman who was considered the world uh, authority on school feeding. And back 100 years ago, if a child had behavior or learning problems, uh, the child would be sent away to a special school for three months, and it wasn't to discipline the child. Uh, they sent these children away to special schools to feed them properly, and what they would be fed oh would be things like more meat and butter, and so they would actually get lots of meat and butter in their diet. They would stabilize their mood and their learning behaviors, and they would go back into regular schools. Because back then, the uh, people in charge of school feeding knew that when kids were, were not eating enough meat and butter, that this would uh, adversely affect their mood and their learning ability. Uh, because in, in many cases, of course, these, rather than eating meat and butter, these families uh, were from low incomes potentially, and they would have been eating things like, um, you know, canned vegetables or drinking coffee instead of whole milk or, uh, you know, other foods that were, were displacing uh, these more nutrient-dense animal foods. So the next slide is uh, an indictment from the World Health Organization. It was a a publication that came out in 2003 from the World Health Organization basically saying that processed foods are causing chronic disease and obesity. Here we see it. And unfortunately, this uh, seminal report that, that was published uh, didn't hardly make uh, any news media sources anywhere in the world. It was a blip on the screen. And, of course, one of the reasons why this, uh, there's so much suppression uh, in terms of this uh, information is because uh, this would hurt the sponsors of uh, people in the media. They would not be too pleased by this uh, report. So um, unfortunately, uh, even our public health officials haven't done anything to warn us about the damaging effects of processed foods. And so, Pam, when and you're talking about processed foods, can I ask you something just to clarify to make sure the, the big deal with that is the partially hydrogenated oil? Is that yeah. Yeah, it's mostly... Yeah, in general terms, it's the foods that sit in the middle aisles of a grocery store. In very simple terms, uh, I don't have a lot of time to itemize things here, but it, that's how I like to globalize it. And then you, you really processed, when I'm talking about processed foods, I mean industrially processed foods. These are foods that have gone through an assembly line typically. They've been heavily uh, adulterated by man. Uh, these are foreign foods. These are foods that a caveman would not recognize, essentially. Okay. Gotcha. And then the, dis the distinction between the animal fats and the plant fats. Can you maybe talk just in very layman's terms, just briefly, because um, I know you have a lot more slides, but I just want to make sure that everybody is staying with us in, in the keeping it simple mode. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the consumption of animal fats versus plant fats and the effect on cell and brain development? Well, the like animal fats like are... The Mm -hmm. Yeah, the animal fats are essentially what we evolved on. They are the foods. They okay. never joined. They never joined the dark side. Okay, uh, it's these edible oils that are newfangled foods that are basically foreign to our body. We're really not adapted to these uh, plant-based oils. You know, pressing oil from a plant is a relatively new phenomenon uh, to to man. Uh, historically, we relied on animal fats uh, to okay. satisfy our appetites. Right? If you look at the word satisfy, mm -hmm. sated saturated, right? When we eat enough animal fat in the diet, it satisfies our appetite. Uh, but animal fats are also crucial for brain health. They're also crucial uh, for the health of the cell membrane. The, 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 you're only really as healthy as your cell membrane. And when you look at the structure of the cell membrane, you'll find out that the fats that come from animal foods are indeed the fats that are crucial for making sure uh, that your cell membrane is uh, formed properly. If the cell membrane, essentially, if you look at it structurally and you compare it to building a house, right, you want your house to be structurally sound, right? But if you're exactly. not giving your body the correct fuel to form the cell membrane in a healthy manner, you're just not going to be healthy. And the, the components of animal fat 
essentially are there to help support the cell membrane. And the uh, components of, of plant-based fats and oils, unfortunately, really don't play a huge role in terms of supporting cell membrane health. The emphasis really in our diet does need to come from animal fats. Awesome. Does that make Thank sense? Thank you for clarifying that. It does, and I want to just make sure, you know, we're keeping it simple and that, they, that everybody that's tuning in is going, okay, I can, I understand that now. I understand why plant versus animal fats, and there's a difference in how the cell membrane, and earlier one of the prior presentations by yours truly myself was about the cell membrane. So hopefully now everybody can connect that presentation earlier in this summit to now what you're presenting here as far as the difference and distinction in fat. So I'm sorry to interrupt you there. You can certainly keep going, but I wanted to make that clarifying point. Not a problem. No, I don't mind okay, if, yeah. if, you, if you want to jump in every so often. Here we see on the next slide uh, from BBC News where they're showing that depression is linked to processed foods. Uh, so more attention in the media here showing that uh, there's a study that adds to an existing body of solid research uh, that shows the strong links between what we eat and our mental health. So again, uh, you know, this mental health, this mental instability we're seeing in society today is not due to a Prozac deficiency or a Ritalin deficiency. It is uh, clearly malnutrition. And from my book, I have some uh, studies that I've uh, cited. I'll just go through them here. Children on low-fat diets yeah. suffer from growth problems and failure to thrive. A low-fat diet is associated with greater feelings of depression, dejection, and anger. In contrast, a high-fat diet is associated with improvements in mood. A low-fat diet is associated with a significant increase in deaths from accidents, suicide, and violence. A low-fat diet may impair cognitive function. Depressed individuals tend to consume more carbohydrates in their diets than non-depressed individuals. And research shows that eating adequate amounts of complete protein can increase alertness. And hopefully that protein is fatty protein. Mm-hmm. So uh, going back to cholesterol, of course, uh, cholesterol is important for many, many things, including the production of a bile uh, and, and including, of course, the production of uh, hormones, the sex hormones. So and we see here it's also important for the um, cell membrane elasticity and strength and it's necessary for brain and nerve development and so on. So let's take a look on the next slide here too where uh, even according to um, a psychiatric journal here is showing that low cholesterol is linked to depression, suicidality, violence, aggressive, and impulsive behaviors. And on slide 33, again, there's just a flow chart showing how cholesterol is necessary for the production of hormones. But let's not forget, like, because our bodies can and do produce, cholesterol is such an important nutrient, of course, our bodies produce about 75% of it. 25% of it, however, should be coming from exogenous or outside sources, and that's one of the reasons why we need it from an outside source because it really is important for bile production. But also within the animal fat, you're not just going to find the cholesterol. You're going to find what are known as these wonderful fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A. Uh, so within the fat, you need the vitamin A in order to allow for the conversion of these hormones to take place. This is the importance of not isolating nutrients. This is why we need the whole food. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's nice that... Uh, you know, I'm seeing some cholesterol supplements on the market, and that can they can be very, very helpful. But I think we do need to get the cholesterol from a whole food form, so we are also getting enough of these fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A. And I will be talking a little bit more about that. Okay. So slide 34 again: cholesterol sh- showing that it's an essential nutrient. Uh, cholesterol deficiency is associated with preterm delivery, abnormally small head size in babies. Uh, the low cholesterol is associated with increased mortality and increased risk of psychiatric disorders, neurological disorders, infectious diseases, and cancer. And in studies, uh, in two studies of autism, more than uh, 50% of children with autism were de- deficient in cholesterol. So this is, again, something that we're now seeing even in association with things like autism. It's remarkable. In my book, I have an interview with Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who wrote the book Gut and Psychology Syndrome. As a medical doctor, Natasha was able to cure her son of autism. And, of course, what did she do? She made sure her son was getting adequate amounts of animal fat and dietary cholesterol in his diet. And now he's just a normal teenage kid. So something we're overlooking here is the importance of cholesterol. Now, in a nutshell, I don't have a lot of time to talk about one of my nutritional heroes here, but that is Dr. Weston A. Price and his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And in a a nutshell, I will just summarize what he did back in the 1930s and 1940s. Of course, I highly recommend everybody read his book. Um, But what he did in the 
mid-30s, as he started as a dentist, he started to see children with cavities and crooked teeth and narrow jaws. And he became, he became very uh, curious about this phenomenon because, of course, he was treating the parents of these children, and the parents didn't have these issues, but the children did. Hmm. And we're starting to see in the 1930s the displacing nature of these, some of these newfangled foods that were rising up in the marketplace. And so he knew that there had to have been some sort of nutritional connection, but he couldn't quite put his uh, finger on it. So he uh, took a camera with him, and he started traveling around the world looking at primitive cultures and looking at the status of their health, both uh, their physical health and their dental health. And in cultures where they were eating their traditional foods, where they hadn't yet displaced their traditional foods with uh, modern industrialized foods, that they had not just uh, excellent overall uh, physical health, they also had very, very health healthy dental structures. So he didn't see necessarily the um, cavities, the crooked teeth, the narrowing of the jaw. And so I just have one slide that I uh, want to show you here that kind of, I think, best encapsulates what he discovered. And this was off the coast of Scotland, off the uh, very northern coast of Scotland in an, on an island where he ran into these two brothers. One of the brothers uh, here on the Isle of Harris we can see in this picture the one brother had displaced his traditional foods uh, and he started eating things like white bread jam, highly sweetened coffee, and also sweet chocolates. And his father told Dr. Price with a deep uh, concern how difficult it was to get his, this son out of bed in the morning and go to work. Whereas the other brother, who had excellent uh, dental health, he had maintained his traditional diet of uh, primitive foods like oatmeal, oat cake, and seafoods, and some limited dairy. And, of course, the dairy would have been farm fresh raw dairy. Uh, so we see here reference not just to physical degeneration happening with the son, uh, the brother here who was eating the displacing foods. Uh, we also see a mention of his mental health, his psychological state. And myself, as somebody who had chronic fatigue, debilitating chronic fatigue for many, many years, I know what it feels like to have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. And this is unfortunately something that I see that is a very pervasive problem among our youth today. And I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, ignoring this, the meaning behind this sluggishness that we're seeing among our children today. We're, you know, a lot of parents and people are commenting on how cute it is that it's tough to get Johnny out of bed in the morning. I don't find oh. it cute at all. I think that oh. after a good night's sleep, you're, you're, you've recharged your batteries, hopefully, uh, and you should, children should wake up in the morning excited about the day, uh, jubilant. You know, they shouldn't have this le lethargy or fatigue that they're feeling in the morning. If you're seeing these symptoms, it's, it's a clear uh, red flag and something needs to be done to fix it. Uh, I have a friend who works for the school board and she says it's amazing how many children line up to get late slips in the morning for school. Oh. And, and the reason why they put on the late slip is because they couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And this was and not their the parents case. can't get out of bed. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Right, and, the parents and, aren't eating well either and the parents can't get out of bed. That's right. And so, uh, yeah, so, it's, it's tragic. It's just tragic. And the people are calling it cute, and we're almost normalizing it today. But it's certainly not cute, no. and it's certainly not normal. So the next slide is a summary. Just one of the most important observations of Dr. Price is that these primitive diets uh, contained about uh, four times the calcium and other minerals and ten times the fat-soluble vitamins as the modern American diet. So let me elaborate on what that actually means, Carmen. Yeah. On the Slide 38, when I'm talking about the fat-soluble vitamins, we think about vitamin A, vitamin D, and we think about things like cod liver oil, which children would have uh, gotten quite commonly before World War II. Vitamin A uh, is crucial for the thyroid gland, protein and mineral, mineral assimilation, hormone production, and many other processes. And vitamin D, of course, is critical for insulin production, mineral metabolism, muscle tone, brain function, and many other processes. So very, very crucial vitamins. And what Dr. Price noted, as I mentioned, is that in primitive cultures, in healthy primitive cultures, that these cultures got adequate amounts of these nutrients. And we're, hmm. we're just not getting enough of these nutrients today. And one of the reasons hmm. why, yeah, if we look at this next slide, uh, oh, slide wow. number 39, and we look at... Uh, the sources of, of vitamin A and vitamin D, and a lot of these foods would be very familiar to our ancestors. They wouldn't have any fear over eating things like uh, organ meats or eggs or butter or uh, the fat of birds like ducks or geese. I mean, they didn't have any of these uh, food phobias. Um, they would have gladly eaten these foods. Um, and, of course, um, these are wonderful sources of vitamins A and D. And uh, they're highlighted in red simply because of the irony 
behind mm-hmm. this situation because it's our government who is telling us not to eat these foods, yet our ancestors uh, survived and thrived quite nicely on these foods. And so the next slide, uh, number 40, is from Chris Master John, and here he's showing that this marriage, this medley of these nutrients that are naturally occurring in animal fat uh, are crucial in order uh, to stabilize our nervous system. They help to regulate very important chemicals in the body called dopamine and cortisol, mm-hmm. which are very important in terms of regulating our mood, in terms of regulating things like anxiety, depression, and motivation. So, again, I'm not talking about isolating uh, these nutrients. I'm talking about the marriage of them and why our ancestors did so well eating things like fatty meats and and eggs with the yolk in there and butter and lard and tallow, is that that the marriage of these nutrients are crucial for our nervous system. And I always tell my clients that uh, the best fuel for the adrenal glands is animal fat, bar none, okay? Okay. So... The next slide, slide number 41, there's a lot of uh, wrongful demonization over something that is naturally occurring in animal fat. This is something you will find in meat and eggs. And butter is arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is one of the most abundant fatty acids in the brain. It serves many important purposes. Deficiencies of arachidonic acid can lead to several health complications. Patients with autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression show low levels of arachidonic acid in their bodies and could be worsened by eating a diet low in animal fat. Individuals with ADHD have significantly lower levels of both arachidonic acid and DHA. Of course, both of these fats are naturally occurring in animal fats. Alcoholics tend to be very deficient in DHA and arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid increases uh, sleep quality during the night and increases energy during the day. And invariably... When I get my students and my clients to consume more animal fat in the diet, typically they come back to me and they tell me that they have more energy and their sleep Mm -hmm. improves. Um, And I will add a a side note to that. If people have been following a low-fat diet, that is, if anybody has been following a diet low in animal fats and they start to reintroduce animal fats in their diet, it can take some retraining of the digestive system to uh, gracefully, shall we say, uh, uh, digest these uh, animal foods, that some people can and do experience discomfort when they slowly or even quickly uh, uh, reintroduce these foods into their diet. It can take some time to remind the digestion to digest these traditional ancestral foods, uh, that essentially the digestive system has gone to sleep and it forgets essentially to forget, it forgets to digest these traditional foods. So sometimes the strategies need to be implemented in order to boost the digestive, uh, the digestive tract. I don't have a lot of time to get into that today, but that's what I have to do with my clients when I work with them individually is mm-hmm. to give them strategies to help them digest these uh, foods that we really shouldn't have ever been afraid of in the first place. Now, uh, the next slide, 42, I'm just showing you just a couple, I'll be showing you some graphs, uh, just very simplistically here showing you that arachidonic acid uh, you can find in things like egg yolks and organ meats, uh, that uh, these, um, these foods, of course, are, are, should be rich in arachidonic acid and are wonderful, wonderful uh, brain food. Excellent. The next slide, 43, uh, subjects with uh, ADHD, reporting many symptoms indicative of essential fatty acid deficiency had significantly lower proportions of plasma, arachidonic acid, and DHA. Here's some more research showing that arachidonic acid and DHA were significantly lower in subjects with ADHD. So essentially they're not eating enough animal foods in their diet. Right. Okay. Slide 44. There's just another uh, nutrient I want to point out here that happens to also be rich in things like organ meats. Remember, our grandmothers told us to eat liver once a week, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, <laughs> that's an acquired taste. I've got to acquire that one. <laughs> so, so phosphatidylserine, another very important nutrient here, showing that phosphatidylserine and improves memory, learning, and other cognitive functions in people who are mm-hmm. substantially impaired compared to others in their age group. Phosphatidylserine can improve activities of daily living and other components of quality of life for people who suffer from more uh, severe memory loss. Phosphatidylserine can improve negative mood or depression and ease anxiety in both young people and the elderly. Phosphatidylserine can help individuals cope with stress, both physical and emotional. And phosphatidylserine has the potential to help children with attention and behavior problems. So on my next slide, 45, again, just an overview quickly showing how important 
a source. These uh, things like organ meats have always been for our ancestors in terms of providing us with phosphatidylserine. And when I say, uh, you know, when I'm talking about meats like organ meats or muscle meats, of course, ideally you want to, if you can, uh, get the gold standard and buy uh, your meats, uh, chickens, whatever, chicken or fish even from wild sources, you want to make sure that the animals are in as close to their natural habitat as possible, right? Uh, I, I, I say that, uh, though I don't want to scare anybody off eating the foods in the outer periphery of a grocery store that have been uh, have gone through the assembly line process uh, in terms of factory farming. Uh, you know, I don't want to scare people off those foods if those are the most accessible ways to buy those foods. I have worked mm-hmm. with people who are on very, very low incomes, and uh, they don't necessarily have the means or the way to purchase uh, food that comes from pasture-raised or wild sources. So all I ask my clients to do is to do the best they can with what they have. Because if I scare people off, and of course I'm against uh, factory farming, that was the nature of my first book, uh, but if I scare people off even the factory farmed versions of meat and eggs, then unfortunately some people may just feel that all they can eat is, are, would be things like soy and, and salad, uh, which would exactly. be doing our children a great disservice, of course. So people just do the best you can with what you have. So slide 45 goes to 46, and um want to point out as well that I really I don't work with people who don't eat red meat in the diet simply because I know it's one of the best sources of zinc. Uh, so I really encourage my clients to eat uh, red meat, hopefully from pasture-raised sources, um, because of the it being one of the best sources of zinc in the, in the diet. Eggs and dairy are okay sources of zinc, but red meat is even a better source of zinc. So uh, by avoiding beef, you are over seven times more likely to suffer a zinc deficiency. And when I test uh, my recovering vegetarian, I call them, of course, I, I see a lot of copper, zinc and copper have an antagonistic nature. And if people aren't eating enough red meat in the diet, unfortunately, copper starts to overaccumulate, and that causes a lot of uh, mood issues. So please eat red meat in the diet. It's a lot easier to be healthy if you eat red meat than if you don't. And this is just a reference from Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. One French account from 1793 estimated that Americans ate eight times as much meat as bread. And by one USDA estimate, the typical American was eating 178 pounds of meat annually in the 1830s, 40 to 60 pounds more than was reported, reportedly being eaten a century later. So essentially what this slide is saying is that we have used wheat to displace meat. Wow. And the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a recovering vegetarian. More and more uh, vegetarians are coming forward uh, talking about the deleterious health effects uh, on their in their lives because of eating a vegetarian diet when genetically they weren't designed for uh, vegetarianism. Uh, so here's just a few examples of books uh, on slide 48, uh, one written by Lear Keith, another book written by John Nicholson, and another one written by Susan Schenk, talking about essentially how sick they got by following uh, vegetarian or, or vegan diet. Um, I ask people if they hear any nutritional advice today that they need to ask themselves these five questions. That you To know whether or not the nutritional advice you're getting, it should show that for generation after generation after generation that this proved that people could be healthy. And ask yourself, does this prove to me uh, that couples are fertile, babies are healthy, that there's no chronic disease or mental disorders in society, that the aging are aging grace, gracefully, and that senior citizens are still productive mem- members of society. People are essentially too um, short-sighted in terms of listening to nutritional advice today. They're hearing nutritional advice that is essentially based upon either dogma, marketing-based science, urban myth, or wishful thinking. That really to know whether or not the nutritional advice you're getting uh, is correct, you have to look back several generations to see whether or not these five questions hold true, okay? So be very, very careful uh, when you're hearing health claims out there today. Slide 49, I'm just finishing up here. Essentially, the components of a healthy traditional diet include these traditional healthy fats like butter, meat fats, egg yolks, and so on. They, ideally, if they could be from pasture-fed sources, uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of raw, farm-fresh dairy products. Mm-hmm. Um, the true superfoods would be things like cod liver oil and organ meats. Uh, bone broth should be uh, a regimen in your diet as well. 
they're fantastic for sealing and healing the gut lining, which, uh, of course, your gut is your second brain, so you need to take care of it. And one of the best ways to do that uh, is through bone broth. But also, of course, lacto-fermented foods are a tremendous medicine for the gut. Uh, things like sauerkraut, I tell all my clients, of course, sauerkraut is extremely medicinal food. Um, these lacto-fermented beverages, the original forms of our pop today, like ginger ale, uh, they used to be very medicinal if you make them yourself and you can easily go online. In fact, on my website, pamcolleen.com, my second page is link after link after link in terms of how to produce a lot, how to make a lot of these foods in your own kitchen, and that includes these lacto-fermented beverages, which um, are much, much healthier than, of course, the stuff that we find on our grocery store shelves today. And, of course, the proper preparation of grains, nuts, and legumes. They need some TLC prior to consumption. So just as I finish up here, uh, I just want to po- point out the importance of this age-old tradition of e- sitting down and eating a family meal and how important that is for not just the entire family but in particular for children. And this is some research that came out uh, just before I published my book. Uh, and it showed that compared to teens who have family dinners twice a week or less, teens who have dinners have dinner with their families five or more nights a week are 32% uh, likely or never to have tried cigarettes, 45% likely or never to have uh, tried alcohol, and 24% likely or never to have smoked pot. And, of course, uh, the 51st uh, slide is showing a uh, thing that I think uh, we've lost touch with, and this is this tradition of eating breakfast, a complete breakfast first thing in the morning, eating a complete mm-hmm. lunch at noon, and eating a complete dinner at, say, 6 p.m. at night. Our bodies are designed to eat consistently through the day, that uh, when we ate like this, Carmen, we have, a, 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 you know, historical data. We have precedents showing that when we ate this way, we were actually pretty healthy. So mm-hmm. when I ask my clients to eat three square meals a day, I know it's not sexy, and I know it's not a fad, so um, it's not new, and people love things that are new. I know it's kind of boring, Carmen, to recommend <laughs> eating three square meals a day, considering how many food fads they get to hear out there. Mm-hmm. But when I tell people to eat three square meals a day, the way our ancestors used to eat, uh, we're not guessing here. We know that when we ate three square meals a day, that before World War II, before we suffered with fat and cholesterol phobia and egg phobia and bacon phobia and red meat phobia and all those food phobias, when we sat down and ate these three square meals, we were healthy, both mentally and physically. So I'm urging your listeners to please disregard any kind of food fad that you listen to out there and just return to these basic uh, premises that uh, we know kept us healthy, okay? It's not difficult to eat three square meals a day. If our ancestors could do it, we can certainly do it. We have more kitchen gadgets than ever before in the history of mankind. We have cooking shows that show us how to cook meals from scratch. We have cookbook upon cookbook. We have so many means to, to teach us and help us. Uh, make three square meals a day. Uh, so we don't really have a lot of excuses uh, to do this. Uh, and I can't urge you enough to do this just for the sake of our children, for, for goodness sake. I mean, we'll look at how sick they are today. Now our doctors are telling us on slide 52 that our children may not live as long as their parents. Uh, and, and then I talked about uh, the next slide, uh, slide, oh, no, I... The next slide is showing you some books, but on the first slide that I showed you, of course, uh, reiterating this, that 25% of our kids uh, have some sort of mental disorder today. And this is uh, unprecedented, of course. That's staggering. So, um, again, I just want to point out, I get a lot of my information through the Weston A. Price Foundation, of which I'm a member. I pay every year to be a member of this organization. I can't thank, uh, you know, Dr. Weston A. Price and uh, the president of the Weston A. Price Foundation, Sally Fallon. I can't thank them enough Mm -hmm. for encapsulating this work so that I can more completely understand really how easy it is uh, to eat healthfully today. I always tell my clients that the, the, the... that really healthy eating is very simple to do. What makes it very complicated is all of this misguided uh, nutritional misinformation that we're getting today. So uh, please simplify your lives uh, for the sake of your children. Eat three square meals a day. These are two fabulous books uh, by Sally Fallon. One is her cookbook called Nour- Nourishing Traditions and her new book, The Nourishing Traditions Book of Baby and Child Care. And uh, the next slide, uh, slide 54, is just an image of my book, Addiction, the Hidden Epidemic, which is essentially a call to action for people to say that, you know, if 25% of our children today have some sort of mental disorder, 
But then what is going to happen to them in 10, 20, 30, 40 years? How are they going to function well in society if they're already showing signs of mental disability or any kind of mental disorder today? Uh, and if they are turning to drugs to stabilize themselves, then what's the future going to be like? How are they going to cope? So please, um, you know, if you if you want to get more information, certainly I have a lot of this information in my book, Addiction: The Hidden Epidemic, and uh, I also on the next slide. 555. I do have a books page where I had a lot of books that have common threads throughout them, t teaching people, encouraging people to return to this paradigm of eating three square meals a day. So my website is just my name, www.pamkilleen.com, and I do a lot of radio shows, uh, including mainstream radio, uh, and I do uh, archive a lot of those radio shows on my multimedia pages, so certainly uh, feel free to take a listen there. If you'd like to friend me on Facebook, I'm also on Facebook. And uh, one of the greatest resources out there, of course, for um, nutritional information is uh, no doubt the Weston A. Price Foundation, which is www.westonaprice.org. And uh, finally, thank you so much, Carmen, for inviting me uh, to this event. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to be here. Oh, Pam, you have just given us an hour's worth of phenomenal information, and I know that's a lot for people to digest. And I hope that, you know, they can obviously listen to the replay again. I think the replays will be available at least for another 72 hours after the, today's airing. So to kind of sum it up, um, hopefully, hopefully you all took away massive notes. You had your pen and paper in front of you writing down all the things that Pam was sharing. And I think if I, you know, I wrote down my notes, loved so much of it, but if I could condense my notes, I would say that your, the three takeaways for parents, if you want to go, okay, what did Pam just say? She just said, avoid the middle aisles. Eat, excuse me, eat your good meat. Get your good fat into your body because, again, from previous lecture, you heard how critical good animal fat is to building the structure of the cell wall. And everything in your child's body is made of cells. Everything in your body is made of cells. So avoid the middle aisles. Eat your good fats and eat your good meat. And number three is to do those three square meals a day. I think those are just wonderful takeaways for parents. And That's right. It that doesn't mean you're right. It doesn't mean anything if you just do that one meal a day, right? We want to do it right. the way our ancestors did it: three square meals. Exactly. Three Imagine those black and white movies. I, I ask people <laughs> return to those black and white movies when, you know, we sat down and they ate, you know, the <laughs> traditional way. Uh, you look, look at them. Look at my three sons. Leave it to Beaver. Oh, you know. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, those were the great. Those were the days. And we do need to go back and refocus, or we're going to lose our children much earlier. Either we're going to lose them emotionally, they're going to detach from us, and we could lose them physically earlier than us. So those are, if you don't have any other reason to change your family's eating habits than those two reasons, love your children enough to change the way you're feeding them because their bodies need certain elements. And Pam, thank you so much for being here today. The, the presentation was fantastic. And everybody, please go visit Pam's website. She's got tons and tons of valuable clear-cut information there for you to get your family healthy. And if you don't know the answer, I'm sure you can try to have a consult with her and help her. And if you need her help do that, I'm sure she's willing to do that as well. So um, be thanks again for being here with us today. And we appreciate you being part of the Healthy Kids Revolution. All right, everybody, hope you enjoyed Pam Colleen. And please, if you have any questions, also please go over to the Healthy Kids Revolution Summit Facebook page, which is just, you know, facebook.com forward slash the Healthy Kids Revolution, and post your comments, your thoughts, your feedback, your best tips. We're loving the community, wanting everybody to share their best practices, because again, it's going to take a village of all of us to raise our healthy children. Hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and be on the lookout for Frida Mooncotch's Sugar Busting Blues the next go-round. Have a great day.